Hi, I'm Bill Rapis, the Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. So today I'm going to cover in about an hour uh, lymphedema and the need for an expanded def definition of that concept address living with lymphedema and we will talk about symptom experiences as reported by patients that include areas related to physical, emotional, social, and spiritual components of uh, their lives. Uh, we will then talk briefly about how all of these symptoms impact quality of life and we will conclude this symposium by talking about living with lymphedema and how to build a healthier life. First, let's talk about lymphedema. Lymphedema is traditionally defined as a pathological condition in which fluid and protein accumulate in the interstitial space, the space between your cells. And we most commonly see this fluid presented in the human body as swelling. There are two categories of lymphedema. Primary lymphedema that occurs in about one out of every 10,000 people under the age of 20. Uh, and patients with cancer and cancer survivors can have primary lymphedema. And I would like to point that out in addition to lymphedema related to your cancer. Secondary lymphedema is directly related to some source of lymphatic trauma. This could be accidents, surgery, cancer, or cancer treatment. And again, it is possible to have both kinds of lymphedema at the same time. Lymphedema is a sign or an objective indicator of a disease that is in this case related to some kind of dysfunction in your lymphatic system. There are symptoms related to this lymphatic discussion, I'm sorry, dysfunction. Symptoms are subjective indicators of the disease, such as pain, sadness, and fatigue. So we propose here, based on our research at Vanderbilt, that the lymphedema definition be expanded from the traditional one to be a more inclusive definition, such as that lymphedema is a pathological condition in which fluid and protein accumulate in the interstitial space and that the condition is associated with the development of physical, psychosocial uh, symptoms. And we really think that if healthcare professionals and patients all had a better understanding of the multiple components of living with lymphedema, that many of the concerns we hear about lack of understanding about uh, lymphedema would in some ways be, uh, begin to be resolved. Now, Lymphedema and its associated symptoms impact quality of life. And I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you with lymphedema that that is the case, nor do I have to tell any healthcare providers who work actively with you. It's just impossible to have lymphedema and these other symptoms and not have some issues in your life. So what is it like to live with lymphedema? We've actually conducted a series of studies over 10 years to learn more from patients with lymphedema about what their lives are like. We have asked them specifically about their swelling and how that impacts their lives, but we've also asked them about those other symptoms that we talked about that might be physical or psychological or social in nature. We talked to people who have swelling in different parts of their body, so we could learn more about what kind of symptoms might be common across all areas of the body when you experience swelling, but also what kind of symptoms may be unique for certain types of swelling. There's an international movement afoot to classify lymphedema into three general categories. 
depending on where it's located in the bo body. Midline lymphedema, which would be swelling from the top of the head down to your groin, upper extremity lymphedema, which would include hands and feet, and lower extremity lymphedema, which include the legs and feet. And uh, there is actually a World Health Organization group that is working on developing uh, some standardized approaches to sell some standardized approaches to uh, uh, identifying symptoms and other problems associated with uh, swelling in these defined parts of the body. So I'm going to first talk about what we've learned about patients who have midline lymphedema. And I'd like to show you an example of one of our patients who's given us permission to use her photograph who had head and neck swelling. We have completed a very large uh, study and found that almost 100% of patients with head and neck cancer develop lymphedema at some point within the first year and a half after treatment. We also have been able to discover, much to our surprise, that in some cases the swelling actually begins before their cancer is ever treated. So clearly there's some kind of issue regarding cancer in uh, the initiation of lymphedema. These patients swell internally in their throat and in their areas where they have to swallow, which we can only see, as you see up here in the top, by putting a scope down them and looking for it. They swell externally, as you see in this photo. This is a woman 15 months post-treatment who had no facial swelling prior to her treatment. And some people, unfortunately, have severe swelling uh, in both their inside structures, such as the epiglottis, which you see here, which is the flap that keeps the food from going down the wrong way when you swallow, and the swelling externally on their face. People who have symptoms related to lymphedema in their head and neck feel very uncomfortable. Their necks and faces may feel tight and stiff. Their skin may get very hard. They also, though, suffer from other problems such as hoarseness or other changes with their voices. They have difficulty swallowing and often feel like something's stuck in, their, stuck in their throat. Imagine what it would be like to have all the, uh, the tube that your food goes down so swollen that your food won't go. And it's very miserable. Uh, and because of um, the swelling that can compromise their ability to breathe, many of them have problems sleeping at night, uh, find themselves having to sleep upright in a chair, for example, if uh, they're in order to breathe. The symptoms that bother them the worst, which we call the highest severity, are actually the swelling in their, when it's in their tongue and the issues related to opening their mouth and the voice issues, people not being able to understand what they're saying and when they have the external swelling being stared at in public when they go out to eat, for example, or even to go to the doctor's office. From an emotional perspective, these patients are very, very distraught about how lymphedema and the swelling impacts their ability to drive. This can take the form of their eyes being swollen and not being able to see how to drive, or their neck being so swollen they can't turn it to see to drive. It's also very distressful because the internal swelling makes them feel like they're choking. Uh, and they also said they get very tired of being grouchy uh, and annoying their family with being grouchy, but they feel so bad they're just grouchy a whole lot of the time. So clearly there are a lot of problems if people have swelling from lymphedema in their head and neck. We've also talked to people who have swelling in their trunk, and that's the area from the top of your shoulders down to your groin that includes the chest and your back. Again, these patients have told us they have heaviness, tightness, they also have pain, and for some reason when they're swollen and their truck standing becomes a problem. Um, they have become very fatigued, they have appearance concerns, and in this group of patients, there also is a real issue about being confident that their, their body is not going to develop some other problem. And they just generally are in a state of anxiety and concern about what's going to ha happen to them next. The symptoms that are the most intense in terms of the actual uh, se severity uh, are, are the self-confidence issues and appearance concerns, but patients with truncal swelling, and keep in mind 
this swelling can be in your reproductive organs, have uh, a lot of issues related to uh, their own personal interest in sex and their partner's lack of interest in sex due to the swelling. From an emotional perspective, there's a lot of sadness in patients with truncal symptoms, a lot of issues around the partner's interest in sex declining, and a lot of conflict in relationships because of that at times. And because of some of the swelling location and the groin area, they become very upset because their social activities have to be limited. Now, let's move on to the arm. And most of us think about breast cancer survivors uh, who have lymphedema and wear the compression sleeves when we think about upper extremity lymphedema. And indeed, we have done quite a bit of work with that patient population here at Vanderbilt. In general, six years after treatment, uh, some studies show that almost 50% of breast cancer survivors have had swelling at least once in their arm after having breast cancer treatment. But about 34% have continuing ongoing clinical evidence for chronic swelling, meaning it doesn't go away. So in general, we think that 20 to 30% of the one and a half million breast cancer survivors in the US may have lymphedema. These patients may also have swelling that extends into their trunk, as we talked about uh, previously, and into the breast tissue itself. But how frequent that pattern of swelling is, is currently unknown. People who have swelling in their upper limbs or arms have the same heaviness and tightness uh, that the other groups have talked about. They have a lot of appearance concerns, but they also tend to have limited their physical activity to a great extent. Some of this uh, is directly related to the continuing uh, confusion on the part of many about how much exercise uh, is appropriate if you have arm lymphedema and um, how much lifting you can do and things like that. The symptoms that bother them the most are sexually oriented type symptoms such as the partner's lack of interest in sex, their own lack of interest in sex, and a change in sexual activity. And when we talk to these women in depth, what we've learned is, these, is that these changes related to sexuality actually come after the lymphedema, not after the breast cancer treatment and their surgery. Um, they are very uh, emotionally upset about uh, a couple of issues we haven't discussed though, which is the lack of coverage or frustration with the inability to obtain supplies uh, for uh, caring for their lymphedema. In the lower extremity, we finished a study uh, of lower extremity lymphedema and uh, Joe Luther and his lymphedema blog followers were great assistance to us in completing uh, this, uh, this study. And I'd like to just give a shout out to them and say thank you very much if any of you are listening for helping us with um, the data collection for the lower extremity patients. First, gynecological cancer survivors about uh, six to 37 percent end up with some kind of swelling in their lower limb. Uh, many people who have swelling in their lower limb also have truncal swelling, so this is not a clear distinction sometimes between one part of the body and the other. And in fact, 88 out of 212 people that we had in our study had combined lower limb and truncal swelling. In this picture, you're going to see uh, the feet and ankles of a lady who has very well controlled lymphedema in her right ankle. I show this because even though this is well controlled, she has several issues that are ongoing, including pain, difficulty moving her foot side to side. She's had to decrease physical activity and she has problems standing. And she remains very angry because she was misdiagnosed for many years told she had arthritis while her foot swelled to the point she couldn't wear a shoe, only to find later that she had lymphedema, which was treatable. And as you can see here with her compression stocking off, that she has managed to get her uh, leg and foot area and ankle down to a size where she can wear normal shoes. This is because she's doing really diligent self-care and had an appropriate diagnosis after many years. People with lower limbs. 
Again, you're going to see they have very similar symptoms to the other groups. Um, and these range from the altered sensations in their body, such as tightness and swelling, to the lack of confidence, sadness, fatigue issues, and also sexual concerns. And I'd like to take just a minute and to tell you that when we ask people about how intense or distressful these symptoms are, we ask them to rate it on a scale of one to 10 from not much problem uh, to extremely problematic. And of all the groups that we've discussed, the patients with the lower limb symptoms had the highest scores for both intensity and distress of any of the other patient groups. And I think that's very important to, to remember that people who have lower limb lymphedema tend to have more severe symptoms than those who have lymphedema in other parts of their body. Um, and I'm not going to read here what you can see on the screen, but again, you will notice that there's a lot of distress in this group about lack of uh, insurance coverage and lack of supplies to take care of their limbs. So what have we learned? Well, a lot of symptoms are common no matter where the swelling is located. We know that everyone has swelling, heaviness, tightness, some kind of pain or discomfort, Regardless of whether your lymphedema is in your head or neck or in your toes, everyone has fatigue that occurs when the lymphedema develops, and everyone has some type of emotional distress. This emotional stress may vary from being um, very sad and having no confidence that you can continue to have a, what you perceive as active lifestyle to some of the sexual concerns that we did discuss earlier in the presentation. Uh, I'd also just like to remind everybody, though, that the swelling in the head and neck group is also sometimes present internally not, and when it is not obvious to you when you're seeing them. So a person who tells you, I have lymphedema in my head and neck, uh, if you look at them and think, well, I don't see any swelling, uh, what you need to understand is that they're swelling when you can't see it. And it's that swelling that makes it so hard for them to breathe and to swallow and to talk. So clearly, it is impossible to have swelling and all of these associated symptoms without having some kind of impact on your quality of life. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how we as scientists define quality of life. We define quality of life as a multidimensional concept, meaning that when we are trying to understand quality of life issues in patients in our studies, we are looking at physical, emotional, social, and spiritual issues. And as you can tell from the symptom presentation we just went through, all of these um, uh, arise to areas of concern in most people who have lymphedema at some point in time of their disease process. And our research clearly shows that every dimension can be impacted by lymphedema. And so how do all these symptoms come together to impact the quality of life? Well, the fatigue in general can make it very hard for you to go about your daily living. These symptoms can also have a loss of function effect in terms of swallowing and chewing in the head and neck patients. Mobility can be compromised, turning your head, moving your shoulders, simple walking. Talking and breathing can also be impacted with trunkal and head and neck swelling. Difficulty sleeping. And this arises from limb positioning being difficult. Managing the limb in a way where you can rest at night can be very burdensome for many patients. And sometimes these odd pains or sensations that people report will wake them up at night. The emotional dimension is very problematic and one of the least uh, attended to components of quality of life in patients with lymphedema, according to the patients themselves that we've talked to. The psychological distress uh, centers in many cases around the loss of confidence that they are continuing to be a normal person. Sadness, depressed mood, anger, and most feel unheard or alone because so few people understand lymphatic diseases and lymphedema. We've already talked about the sexuality issues and the complaints that the patients have to us is no one wants to talk to them about this and they are very uncomfortable bringing up their subjects uh, 
to about sexuality to their health care providers. So many of them suffer in silence. Many have body image issues. They feel unattract unattractive. And in our breast cancer work, we found even if someone who has a moderately swollen arm perceives that it's a lot of swelling, that it's the perception of that person that actually makes the symptom profile more severe. Um, it's probably clear to all of you who are listening or to healthcare providers who work with patients with lymphedema that body image is also an issue where wardrobe alterations comes into play. Difficulty finding shoes, clothes that fit, clothes that make you look like a regular person. People uh, want to look good so they feel good about their body image. And in many cases, this is a problem. General loss of confidence in the body to perform uh, also can happen. Then there are the social issues that come into play that make this a very problematic uh, quality of life experience for people with lymphedema. Financial difficulties can be related to that treatment expense, lack of insurance, things like that. But it can also be related to job changes due to restrictions because of the swelling or because of the lymphatic disease that result in less work income or even having to go on disability in some cases. Social withdrawal also is an issue. Many patients self-restrict activities or hobbies or interactions for fear of harming themselves or in some cases because they have been told that they need to restrict themselves uh, by a healthcare professional who may not understand that movement is actually, for example, helpful to the lymphatic system. Many avoid social events when attire is of concern, and many of the head and neck cancer patients simply do not want to go out to any social engagement where they are required to eat or drink or have their face seen if it's very swollen. Socially, time management is a problem. You have to manage time for self-care, your care of your children or your grandchildren, time with your spouse, and many times people shut down any external to the family's social activities because they simply can't manage one more thing in the course of their day. So they are denying themselves fun. And fun is very important for all of us. Lifestyles change. And I don't know if any of you listening have had lifestyle changes, but many people have given up hobbies and again have had significant impacts on relationships with their family. Spirituality is an interesting dimension of quality of life from uh, our perspective as a scientist because we've seen uh, a, a dichotomy or kind of a two-pronged uh, uh, effect of lymphedema on the spiritual quality of life that people have told us they have. We've seen people who talk about a crisis of faith where they feel anger towards God abandoned by God abandoned by their fellow man. But then we have another group of people who tell us that once they dealt with the fact that they had lymphatic disease or lymphedema, that they had a restored faith and that they found new priorities in their life, that family time became more important than other things, and that life itself just became unimpo more important, certainly not unimportant, but definitely more important. So while we've talked a lot about negative things that may happen with lymphedema, again, it is possible to turn some of these experiences into uh, spiritual benefits to yourself. So I hope I haven't depressed everyone by talking about all the things we've learned about what can and does happen to people who have lymphedema. But I hope your, the take home message from the first part of this presentation is that if you or anyone you love or anyone you care for as a healthcare provider uh, in your practice has lymphedema, that that's not all that they have. And that we need to be aware of the multifaceted impact that this condition has on people and their quality of lives. And we need to open up communication channels with each other, family member to family member, patient to doctor, doctor to patient, scientist to patient. So we can begin to help people with lymphedema build a healthier life for themselves. And the rest of this presentation, 
I'm going to talk about some of the things we have learned from patients with lymphedema, about how they have put together a healthier life and a life for which they are now satisfied with their own quality of life. It is not always an easy journey for that to happen, but I can tell you that it is possible. So let's move on to the next part of this presentation where we hope and I hope that you will come away feeling empowered to go out and take charge of your life and recapture that healthy, vibrant life that all of you deserve to have. First, I'd like everyone to think for just a minute that it is possible to have an acceptable quality of life despite having lymphedema or lymphatic disease. And by acceptable, I mean a quality of life for which you are personally comfortable experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because my perception of what your quality of life is as a scientist really has little to do with whether you have a good life or not. It's your perception as someone with lymphatic disease or lymphedema about your own quality of life that is the utmost importance. So, how can you begin to build a healthier life? How have patients with lymphedema begun to build a healthier life? One of the first things, and I'm sure it's obvious to most of you, is that taking care of the actual swelling with lymphedema has to uh, be a priority. And when first heard self-care of lymphedema, we generally think about applying uh, garments, massaging our arms, and the things that are physically done uh, to manage our, our swelling, medications in some cases, things like that. But as you have learned earlier in this presentation, lymphedema does not occur in isolation from the rest of the body. Many of those symptoms that we talk about occur in other parts of your body. Fatigue occurs everywhere in your body, for example, not just the part that's swollen. So lymphedema has a systemic impact, impact and self-care uh, needs to include all of yourself, not just the swollen components, if you're going to build a healthier life. And so it's very important to consider how you can give attention to your overall physical health, your emotional well-being, your social well-being, and your spiritual well-being. And if you're a healthcare professional listening today, it is important for you to always evaluate those four dimensions of your patient when you see them and to ask how they are doing in those areas so you can best help them claim a good quality of life. So what can you do to live better with lymphedema? Again, we've talked about tending to all aspects of the quality of life that you have physical, emotional, spiritual, and social. Let's talk about things that patients with lymphedema have found very helpful to becoming more comfortable with the physical dimension of their quality of life. First, lymphedema self-care to keep the swelling under control creates many challenges. And lymphedema self-care should become part of a balanced approach to life, not the overwhelming component of your life. And people who conduct lymphedema self-care in a way that is balanced as just a part of their life tend to do better uh, doing their self-care on a regular basis and physically with the condition itself. It's important to remember that no two people with lymphedema are alike. Lymphedema self-care needs for not only the swelling, but for all these other aspects of the quality of life needs to be coordinated with the lymphedema therapist and primary care provider. So you can have a tailored approach to self-care that works uniquely for you. And you can incorporate self-care into a reasonable part of your daily routine but not into uh, 24 hours of your day. So let's move from taking care of the swelling to taking care of your overall physical health. 
and I would not be a good nurse if I did not talk about preventive health care. I'd like to ask all of you who are listening to think about where you are with preventive care for parts of your body that are very important to you. Eyes, teeth, and hearing, and your ears. Are you getting regular visits? Visit vision screenings? Are you going to the dentist? And have you had your hearing checked if you just don't hear as well as you want to? Cancer screening, mammographies, pap spears, PSA tests for men. Again, uh, timely examinations. If you have a problem arise, it's new and different for you physically and an annual physical examination. People who live well with lymphedema tend to routinely tend to these preventive care needs to avoid other complications with their health. People who live well with lymphedema also pay attention to their nutrition. And I would like to point out, I'm not telling everyone that you have to go on a diet and lose weight. Because first of all, not everyone needs to go on a diet and lose weight. The trick to having better nutrition status is to have a balanced diet. And there's a great free website called Choose My Web Plate, my, choosemyplate.com at the um, government website that can really tell you a lot about how to structure just a healthy diet. diet. Not a weight reduction diet, a healthy diet. Um, and the other thing that people have told us is it's very important to stay well hydrated because if they get dehydrated, their swelling may actually get worse. So water is a really good thing to drink. Uh, caffeine actually can dehydrate you. So if you're a heavy caffeine drinker, you really need to make sure you're getting enough non-caffeinated beverages in your body every day so you don't inadvertently dehydrate yourself. And in terms of nutrition, weight management is the key. You need to know whether you need to gain weight, stay the same, or lose weight. And the Centers for Disease Control have a website where you can go to and uh, put in your height and weight, and it will actually tell you uh, if you need to gain, lose, or maintain weight. Uh, but that's uh, a sensitive issue for everyone. And all I would hope that you would get, take away from this slide is to try to have a balanced diet and be aware of where you are in terms of weight and to stay well hydrated. Now, this is a quote from one of our patients who's been in a focus group. And I'm going to read this to you just so you can understand the importance of weight to lymphedema outcomes if you are overweight. As a result of going through my breast cancer treatment, I gained a substantial amount of weight. All the hormones and being put into early menopause and medications, I gained over 90 pounds and got to a point where to me the additional weight was worse than having cancer because I've always been weight conscious. I've never been small, but I've always been weight conscious. I spoke with some of my physicians and got on a path of really picking up some activity, but also cutting down on carbohydrates. I'm a sugar fanatic and I had to kind of eliminate some of these things from my life. As a result, I lost over 90 pounds in a year and that has helped me tremendously. I actually see several physicians who believe that's one of the most impactful things you can do to help reduce lymphedema. I didn't realize the size of my arm was so big until I looked back. I always knew I had that Popeye arm, but I didn't realize the broadness from the sweat. This patient um, literally went from having to have all of her clothes custom made and her garments custom made for her arm for the lymphedema compression to being able to wear regular size clothes and off the shelf cheaper garments for compression because of her year long pragmatic approach to weight loss. Movement. I am someone who really believes that movement, not exercise, is the key to health, meaning that uh, when we tell people you need to go out and exercise 30 minutes six times a day, uh, I find that most people, one, are not receptive to that, and two, most people are not able to do that as a part of their regular life. 
So I'm a real proponent of physically just moving your body, walking when you can walk, uh, stretching, doing yoga, things like that. And that's because lymphedema uh, can actually be reduced by good muscle movement. Muscle movement helps move lymph. So if you sit around and don't move your body, you're likely to have more swelling, regardless of what part of the body the swelling's on. So there's many, many uh, benefits to moving, as you see here on the slide. But I would just encourage everyone to understand that the patients that work with us who tell us that their life is of a quality they accept have found some way to incorporate more movement into it, not necessarily more hard exercise. They aren't running marathons, but they are walking or going up steps when they used to take the elevator and they've made simple life changes that have really helped them get moving. Some exercise choices for people with lymphedema include stretching, aerobic exercises such as riding a bike and dancing and swimming. And we have a whole group of patients who tell us that swimming has literally changed their lives. Strength training to your personal tolerance level can also be done if you have lymphedema. I would suggest you work with your primary care physician and a lymphedema therapist to determine how best to do that, but you can do strength training. Have movement, the remedial exercises you were taught when you go through your lymphedema treatment uh, are also important to keep doing on a regular basis. Let's talk a little bit about sleep and relaxation. I would like to think everyone listening sleeps really well, but I would think probably about half the people listening today don't. And here are just some tips we've gotten from patients about how they have been able to start to sleep better when they took control of their environment and their body. First, many tell us that it's very helpful to have the bedroom only be for sleep and not have computers or TVs in the room, and to have a good thermostat where you can turn the heat up and down, keep yourself either cool or warm, depending on whether you're cold or hot natured. And that they learned that sparing expense in mattresses and pillows was a foolish thing because you spend a third of your life in bed. So they have gone out and found mattresses and pillows that actually were more comfortable to them to sleep on at night. They've also found that if they reduced their caffeine in the evenings, even if they were very heavy caffeine drinkers, that less caffeine in the evening helped promote their sleep. And some of them have found it was very helpful to talk to their healthcare provider if they weren't sleeping for uh, sleep evaluations for sleep apnea, which some people may have and not know it, uh, medication prescriptions or other uh, ways that a healthcare provider might help you become uh, able to sleep better such as teaching you relaxation techniques for, uh, for your body. In emotional health, patients tell us that lymphedema is like an uninvited guest that has entered their lives and that it brings a lot of unexpected losses to how they're able to live their life and many challenges. These issues, the unexpected losses and challenges are actually common to many people who have chronic diseases, whether it be diabetes, arthritis, or lymphedema. People who have successfully dealt with these issues and are living a healthy life and a happy life with their lymphedema tell us that what was very important to them was to not get stuck in the anger about having the condition or feeling sad all the time about what you have lost. Um, you actually have a lot more control than you realize about your feelings and your emotional well-being being when it comes to your lymphedema. However, many of you complain that you are not tended to physically or emotionally when you see your physician. So if you feel like you are very emotionally distressed because you were not getting what you need from a healthcare provider, as you can see from the quote here, you are not alone. So we're going to just briefly let you hear from some patients who've successfully dealt 
with some of their emotional issues about lymphedema. This woman talked to us about the importance of honestly assessing how she really felt about herself. And here you will see a quote from her that says her appearance was what bothered me the most and that it was, she was very frustrated that people didn't understand what was wrong with her and why they couldn't drain the fluid out of their arm and why she couldn't just take a pill and make it get better. And when she really sat down and thought about what she was feeling, she was then able to come up with a plan that she designed to try to help deal with these emotions and to deal with the um, uncomfortable um, comments made to her about her appearance and how her arm looked. So first, it's important if you're angry or sad to basically uh, acknowledge that you're angry and sad. And then, as that patient did, once you know what's going on with you emotionally from a self perspective, you can plan how you're going to respond to your emotions. And here is an example of how someone did that who was very uncomfortable about what people were saying about her arm. And she said she learned to just explain what it was. And she actually wrote herself a little script about what was wrong with her arm, memorized it. So then when someone said, what happened to you? What's wrong with her arm? She did what she called her little educational speech to let them know about it. But she found this very empowering to try to plan in advance for dealing with these questions that bothered her. Many people use humor. One of our patients talked about how she dealt with children in her kindergarten where she was a teacher who always would look at her arm and say, hey, what's that? And she would tell them, oh, it's an artificial arm with a real hand. And she did that in front of parents and the parents would look at her and say, oh, great, I've got to explain that one. But she would use humor with the children. And when she said that, the children, instead of being afraid to touch her arm or her hand, would come up and actually engage with her as their teacher in ways they didn't do before she began to inject humor into her relationships with her kindergartners. Emotional health. Empowering yourself is the strongest single message people have given us over the years about how to deal with their anger and frustration and emotional distress related to lymphedema. Here's a rather lengthy quote, and I will just highlight it to you. But basically, this quote comes from a woman who felt like healthcare professionals and people who wore white coats and scrubs were all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipotent people who truly, surely knew more about lymphedema than she did. She became very humbled when she realized that many of her healthcare providers truly knew less about her arm swelling than she did. So she decided that she would learn to say no to things such as blood draws where they shouldn't be drawing blood. She engaged her husband to help her set limits when she was getting treatment for cellulitis. And she realized that she had an unrealistic expectation that everyone really couldn't be educated about lymphedema and everyone wasn't wiser. So she gave herself permission to ask a lot more questions of her healthcare providers about what they knew about her swelling, to say no when she was asked to do something that she didn't think was in her own health best interest, and to be persistent. So she felt like once she acknowledged her anger, came up with some responses for how to deal with the situations that were angering her, and actually implemented them, that she became empowered to have a better life. I would caution that some people with lymphedema have a medical condition called depression, which is different from simply being distressed about the condition. And if you find yourself having a pervasive sad mood, consistently negative, lost interest in former activities you used to do, uh, and particularly if you've ever had thoughts of harming yourself or others, you have uh, something that is more serious than emotional distress and it requires medical attention. So if any of you in the audience experience this, please see a therapist or a psychiatrist. It is possible for depression to be successfully treated and for you not to feel this way 
if you have this experience right now. Social health. At home, it is important to communicate with others closest to you so they understand that even though some days you may look like you're okay to them, that there may be things going on. This means talking to them about sexual issues, home responsibilities, how much you can or cannot do, and how to engage in leisure activities at home. When we talk to people who live with patients who have lymphedema, they tell us that their hardest uh, issue is having to guess what someone really needs to do from a social perspective. And they always ask the patients, they could just be more direct with them about their needs socially, uh, that they would be better able to help them. And the same goes for work. You may have to set limits at work, but there are ways to set limits uh, at work and not uh, create controversy at work. Educating people you work with about your potential limitations is important, and you have to be your own best advocate. Uh, and clear, assertive communication about help needed for physical tasks is important at work. They can't read your mind. They can't accurately guess what you need or identify your problems unless you tell them. Now, it is also important, though, to give back to the work environment in any way you can, despite having lymphedema, so that the people at work with whom you socialize do continue to perceive you as a team player and a valuable member of their work community. Patients say it works best when they tell people at work what they can or can't not do, when they ask what they need uh, directly from people, and most of the people find when they communicate they are able to work out things, particularly with their coworkers. It's important to continue to play. And many patients who deal successfully with lymphedema do have hobbies. They go out for entertainment. They volunteer to help others and do things like that to shift attention away from the worry they have about their future. And this is actually a psychological technique called appropriate distraction, meaning that other activities can distract you from feeling about bad about your own life circumstance. And certainly hobbies, going to movies, volunteering to help others, things like that are better than other distractions that people may use, such as drinking too much, taking illegal drugs, etc., which doesn't solve problems. So we would encourage you, based on our research findings, to look for ways to inject fun in your life occasionally. Spiritual health. Some people describe seeking positive energy as the single best action they could take to help deal with some of their issues regarding lymphedema. And they do this by surrounding themselves by positive people um, in their personal lives and by healthcare professionals who are educated about lymphedema or whom they have educated and can now work with. Um, one lady described this, I thought, quite eloquently when she said, some people can be emotional vampires. Those negative sucks. folks, they suck the energy right out of you. I don't have to lunch with those girlfriends. And this woman took very proactive stances about who she spent her time with and found she could enjoy and socially engaging with people and felt better just in general. Other people have found gratitude and have learned to look at what they still can do despite some of the limitations of lymphedema, and have become thankful for being alive when they've had cancer, or being alive when they've been in accidents, or being alive when they have lymphatic diseases, and still being here and cognitively aware of what's happening, and being able to enjoy themselves with some effort. So in summary, living with lymphedema is challenging, and any chronic condition comes with uncertainties and risks which naturally promote anxiety and worry. Living with these risks and uncertainty and losing the carefree sense of taking your bodies for granted is a substantial loss for many people with lymphedema. And the daily task of taking care of the swelling alone, not to mention all the rest of you that we talked about, can be daunting. However, never forget, 
that it is possible to live well with lymphedema. One lady gave us the perfect summary for this lecture. You can learn to deal with it. Do what you have to do to take care of yourself. And we're doing all of that. It takes away the gloom, the uncertainty, and all the mixed emotions. And you're back, meaning the quality of life that you have is one that you are happy with and that you value. And at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions. And what I will do is read some of the questions that have come in and take the next five to 10 minutes to answer them. First, the first question that has come in is, how can I educate my own doctor about lymphedema? And uh, what many patients are doing are going to uh, websites such as the National Lymphedema uh, Network website, LEARN, the American Cancer Society website, and the National Institutes of Health website. And I will put some of those resources up here for you to see because I happen to have them here. And learning everything they can about their disease and then actually physically printing out copies of handouts about lymphedema and making their doctors read them or their nurse practitioners read them in the doctor's office before they will answer any of the questions the doctors are answering about for help. So uh, the answer is how uh, can you help your um, doctor uh, become more educated is to proactively learn more yourself and then take your knowledge and share with them. And you can refer them to the webinars at LEARN's website because they're free and they could certainly go in and watch some of the webinars that LEARN has sponsored. Another question is, why do healthcare professionals know so little about lymphedema and all the problems that go along with it? My lymphedema therapist is the only one who gets it. Uh, that's a common complaint and it is um, because many healthcare professionals are taught very little in medical school, nursing school, physical therapy school, you name it school, about the lymphatic system. And you really have to understand the lymphatic system to understand lymphedema and all the potential problems that happen. And uh, your therapist gets it because if you're seeing a certified lymphedema therapist, they have gone to a, a training program specifically about lymphedema and have learned a lot about lymphedema. So um, the other issue is that a lot of healthcare professionals do not see a lot of lymphedema patients in their practice. And uh, doctors and nurse practitioners tend to keep up on the diseases they see most commonly in their patient practice, but maybe not so much on the less common diseases. Uh, so uh, that just speaks to the need for you to try to help educate them too. Um, here's another one. You mentioned primary lymph issues start at a young age. There's primary tardive that can start in your 30s or 40s. This should be mentioned as doctors don't always understand and misdiagnose patients with lymph issues. Lymphedema that's primary can start at a young age. You're exact, and as this person so rightfully pointed out, can start later in age. Uh, and uh, it is very important to know that if you start swelling in your 30s or 40s and it hasn't happened before, that you could have primary lymphedema and you need to go see someone. And uh, it's also very common that uh, women who may have a primary uh, underlying latent lymphedema may also have uh, the lymphedema occur and become chronic uh, as a result of pregnancy. So if you have swelling during the pregnancy that isn't managed medically very well during the pregnancy, uh, you really need to uh, keep an eye on that and see if you're getting chronic uh, lymphedema. Another question, I've been denied insurance twice, not medically necessary when requesting a pump. I'm unable to wrap myself and lymphedema impacts all parts of my body. Any suggestion? 
uh, I would uh, make a couple of suggestions to you. Um, first, um, the National Lymphedema Network has worked with a lot of patients to help them craft letters and to help their physicians craft letters uh, to try to appeal denials. So that's a good resource to contact. Um, wrapping is definitely a problem. And in this case, I think it would be very important to get with a therapist who can talk to you about other creative ways to do compression. I don't know where your swelling is, if it's, uh, but for example, some people who uh, have trunkal swelling will wear an underarm compression garment like you can buy at a sports store and have gotten some help from that. Um, it is uh, very hard without seeing you to know exactly what would work best for you. But uh, I would encourage you, uh, if you don't have a therapist who thinks creatively, to try to find a therapist who can help you look at some creative ways to deal with this. And let's see, do we have some other questions here? Um, I, I think that uh, we may have one more. So give me just a second to read it. Is it really possible for someone with very bad swelling to have a good quality of life? Uh, I think that's the last question that I have time to answer. And I think that's probably one of the best questions that anyone with lymphedema could ask because it gets at hope. I can tell you from personal experience from working over the last 10 years with probably 500 to 600 people who have lymphedema for various reasons and who live with it every day, that it is possible to have a quality of life that you find acceptable to you. You have to work uh, at it, uh, find a therapist who understands your needs, find a primary therapist. Uh, care physician that you can either educate about lymphedema or already knows about it and work on developing an individual comprehensive self-care plan, not just a lymphedema care plan. Uh, I have seen people with extremely severe lower limb lymphedema be very happy and feel like they have an excellent quality of life and people with what other folks might think to be minor swelling have very poor quality of life. So um, you have the power to make things better. And, um, and yes, it is possible. It may not be easy, but it is possible. And with that, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And this uh, presentation will be saved at the LEARNS website. And uh, again, thank you for uh, joining me. And uh, my best wishes to you uh, as you pursue uh, finding your best quality of life as you live with them. Thank you.